Welcome to Archery Talk 101 podcast, your guide to better archery skills. We'll bring you the latest tips, tricks, and expert advice, but that's not all. We'll also have interviews with top archers and industry professionals and reviews of the latest gear and equipment and much more. Yep, got that. Yeah, we got we got it going here today uh, on this episode of Arch Talk uh, 101. We're at uh, podcast number 153 now. So we've been doing it for a while and having lots of fun. Hi, my name is Rory Canterbury. I'm going to be your host in Arch Talk 101. And we have a special guest on the line with us. And we're going to let him introduce himself and then tell us a little something about him. Welcome well, thank show. you, Rory. I'm, I'm uh, D. Falks. Uh, I've been an archer for a long time. I don't know, almost 30 years. Um, I was the national director for the Archery Shooters Association from 2002 until 2022. I've been on the board of directors for USA Archery. I was there for eight years. Uh, I was a JOAD committee member for USA Archery for over six years. Uh, I was instrumental in starting the Scholastic 3D Association, S3DA. And I was with Jenny Richardson from almost from the start, from about 2003 until, well, until we uh, formed S3DA in 2000 and. I guess 12 uh, with uh, NASP. And I've done a lot of contract work with the ATA and uh, I even wrote a book, Inner Archery. Know how good you are, believe it's good enough. <laughs> and so, which you can also pick up on Amazon or Lancaster Archery Supply. But it's, yeah, yeah, so it, I've had a good- We'll leave a link in the description on how to get it for those that, that want to get it. That, that makes yeah. it easier to get it, though, to remember. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a real, it's, it's, it's a pretty fun book. We'll talk about it later. But yeah. I've had a really good. I've had a really, really good career, in, in archery, and archery has been very good to me. And now that I'm pretty much semi-retired, I'm I'm not working for ASA anymore. I'm I'm doing. I'm on the board for the S3DA. Uh, I wrote all their instructor curriculum. I do a lot of coaching, so I'm just having fun being semi-retired and traveling the world to archery tournaments and doing a lot of coaching and just having a good time. Sounds like a a, a lot of fun, and you done lots and lots of things with archery yeah i've been very lucky i'm very lucky and i just have to say that you know i, I have to give so much credit to mike terrell and the asa because when i started there in the summer of 2002 uh he started me right off in 2003 went to the ata show made some contacts and he was not that interested in going to a lot of the big hoopla events like the ata summits and all this stuff uh he preferred to be a little bit more low key and manage ASA as a whole. And he sent me. And so, you know, I got to, I got to make a lot of contacts and that's, and that it, it helped out. I followed, I just followed wherever they, they led me and I got my coaching certification and I got to work on junior dream team and started international coaching. And, and so if it hadn't been for that job with ASA, I would just been another stick flinger out there, you know, going to 3d tournaments and, Having some having a good time with with the boys, but um, luckily I got a job that literally promoted me, you know, from the ground up. That that sounds really interesting. So, what made you get started in archery? Well, I, back when I was a kid, you know, I walked across the street to Sears and I bought this little blue recurve bow with some um, fiberglass arrows and lost all my arrows shooting at blackbirds in the backyard. So that kind of ended that career within a week or so <laughs> and i didn't have enough allowance to buy any more arrows so i just blew it off but um about 25 years ago uh, i didn't even own a bow then uh, and i was uh had a hunting buddy down in in fayetteville tennessee and went down we were supposed to clear some shooting lanes for for rifle season and i drove up into his uh driveway and he was out in the backyard had a had a a bag target with a picture of a deer on it. And he was shooting arrows at about 20 yards into that bag target. And so I was joking. I said, Donnie, you know what the hell? You can't even hit that bag with your bow. How are you going to kill a deer? And he said, well, by the time you're in a tree stand in mid-November freezing your butt off, I'm going to have my tags filled and I'll be watching football. <laughs> I, I didn't believe him. But at the end of this end of the year, he told me he was going to buy a brand new Hoyt. And he gave me that old PSE Mock Flight 4. And that's what started my archery career. It had about a 31-inch draw, and I'm a 28-inch draw. 
<laughs> I mean, I was anchored back behind my ear. My wife thought it looked like fun. And so I had to buy her a brand new Matthews MQ1. And that started an escalating arms race that to see who could spend the most money on the least amount of equipment. <laughs> and, it, and it was, it was a lot of fun. We, uh, we shot archery every day, uh, every weekend, went to archery tournaments, indoor, outdoor, shot field archery. And, and if that, he, if he hadn't given me that old bow at the end of that year, I probably never would have gotten into it like I did. You know, I, I might have, maybe, but I have to, I tell you, old Don Dickey giving me that bow was what really started me on my archery career. And I mean, that old bow finally blew up and I had to buy a brand new Matthews. And of course, more money, more money. I, I've shot everything. I've shot Matthews, Hoyts, and Botex, and PSEs, Dartons. I mean, shot them all. And I just love archery and I love coaching archery and and I have to, you know, credit that old hunting buddy, man. He got me hooked, got me started, and it just took off from there. Yeah, it's you never know, you know, when you get into a sport or doing something, you know, you it's like, nah, I don't want to do that. And then you go out, do it the first time, and it's like, oh, this is fun. And then you just you just keep going and going and going. And next thing you know, you, you've spent a lot of years doing doing it and and you don't ever want to stop. Yeah, it's like that. I mean, the the first arrow I ever shot out of that bow is still in the backyard there somewhere. I was about twenty yards from the target. <laughs> I mean, I didn't even know how to look. You know, watch arrows fly. I just put a pin on the target and pull the that old finger release. I pull the trigger and like, oh my god, where'd it go? It's not in the bag. So then I walked up about walked up about five feet from the bag and then you know did a little walk back from there to get my sights on. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, it, it 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 got me hooked and. I think my wife, you know, shooting too, she said, man, this looks like fun. And so we started shooting and it was indoor season. So we shot indoor. Then we went and started shooting 3D outdoor. Then we learned how to shoot field archery. And if she hadn't really, you know, gotten to be so hooked, then I probably wouldn't have gotten to be hooked at, at such a high level. Because, I mean, we literally spent so much money on the sport that, one day she was looking at the credit card bill and said, you got to figure out how to make this thing pay for itself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, I, mean, I said, well, the only way to do that is like when I was skydiving, you know, it's like, well, become an instructor. And so I started, I got my instructor certification from Jenny Richardson. That was why I got started with NASP. And then uh, I did that for about, I don't know, four or five years. And then about 2007, I was talking to one of my buddies and he said, well, he said, how much you charge? And I said, well, back then I was charging 25 bucks an hour for instruction. And he said, well, you charge 50 bucks if you get a coach rating. I'm like, oh, yeah. So I went and got me a coach certification, and that's where it really took off. And not because of the money, but once I learned what coaching really was and the opportunities that, you know, would be afforded by being a coach, the travel, the international work and stuff. And so my wife and I really used that as a reason to take vacations to foreign countries that we would never have gone to just to go vacation. But since there was an archery tournament, oh, heck yeah, man, sign me up. I'll go to, you know, I'll go down to Guatemala for 10 days and, and have fun. So, you know, I've been on 49 international archery events since 2009, and that's 49 places I would have never gone if I wasn't shooting a boat. Yeah, yeah. That's well, and then too, when you have business, that's business expense. Hmm. Yeah, <laughs> you got to watch out. You don't take it into the red. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> you, you just you just got to have uh, you know ha have have a little advantage when you take it and use it when you can, and um, you know that's what good tax accounts are good for. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I agree, man. It's but it's it's been a real fun ride. And I've I've learned a lot along the way, and and uh, I mean I I left a landscaping business I built up after I retired from the army, and and I I loved it because it was an instant gratification sort of thing. You know, you go in, you you plan out and you install some big landscape, and you know, to me it was always more important to to look at it and say, man, this is really great. I took this yard from dirt to you know a, a showcase. And sometimes you'd make enough to pay for your work. And sometimes you, you wouldn't, but it was the, the satisfaction of just seeing that job well done. I got to shoot an archery and, and after I'd been shooting for a couple of years, I was a 
the uh, Tennessee State Assistant ASA Director, which really had not much of a job, but it, I had met Mike Terrell, and I guess I impressed him on the on the the ASA tour on the range. One day I had a complaint, and I said, Mike, you know, this is a bunch of BS here, and blah blah blah. And he said, Well, what do you want me to do about it? I said, well, Here's what I think you ought to do about it. And so I let him know what I thought would solve it. And he says, you know what? Well, what it was, there was a target that was about four yards too far. And and back then the rule said, you know, that there will be a measured distance, you know, unknown distance, but measured. And so there was this antelope. And I was shooting with some high-powered people, Brandon Reyes and, and a couple of other guys. I mean, they're, they're big-time archery now in the open sea class and a long time ago. Yeah, and I shot that antelope first, and I went about a foot under its belly. I thought it was maxed out. I was like, "Oh man, it's further." So Brandon added some yardage and went over its back, and it was a terrible target. And at that time, uh, Bill Baker was who was the national was the tournament director was standing behind me, and I walked over to Bill and I said, "Damn, Bill, that antelope's way over forty yards." And he pulled a rangefinder out. And went, yeah, you're right. <laughs> so, <laughs> About that time, Mike Terrell walked down, and I, I kind of laid into him a little bit. And, and he said, well, what do you want me to do about it? I said, well, have them range them. I said, you know, the, the thing is, is they can range every just walk down and go, boom. If it's a 40-yard range, 40, 40, 30, 40, 32. And if it's over 40, move the stake. I said, Christ, man, nobody, you know, people don't mind if you set targets up and make it hard. They don't mind scoring low. But when they start missing targets and losing $15 arrows, they get a little pissed off. Right. <laughs> So a couple months later, he came to me with a project uh, called the the uh, the Top Gun Team Challenge, and he wanted me to to team up with Ginger Hopwood at the time and then get the Top Gun Team Challenge going. So we we picked like three or four people each, and we had a, a team that we came up with this Top Gun Team Challenge, and and it, it it was really good. It ran for about three years, and then it kind of petered out. But uh, the next summer, he he came up and asked me if I would be his national director and i was you know really excited like oh man that's really great thanks mike you know why why'd you pick me he said well he said you're the first person that's come up to me with a problem and offered me a solution on the spot instead of just bitching about it and walking away <laughs> so <laughs> i guess i sure screwed that one up <laughs> yeah. so you know it, it's I, I i had a good time i spent like i said I spent 20 years two months with ASA, that's one month longer than I spent in the army, and uh, it, it it really afforded me a lot of opportunities. Yeah, that was that, that's quite a long time to be be in in that career, especially you know if you enjoy it. It's it doesn't seem like that long, does it? No, it didn't actually. You know, and I I look back and you know I remember the first year is uh, there wasn't a lot of stuff you know for the ASA Federation, which is a big part. It's a big it's huge. And a lot of people overlook the Federation itself, which is all the clubs, you know, the 350 clubs and the 10,000 members and, you know, how many tournaments. I mean, the last year I was the national director, we put on 300 and 375 qualifiers and state championships. And that, that was what I was in charge of, was doing all the coordinations for that. Me and my regional directors and state directors. And the first year after I took the job in August, uh, I mean, I spent all... Dude, I was up in a tree stand with a laptop, actually <laughs> writing up, writing up, you know, all the all the stuff, you know, all of the the procedures and policies and everything. And so it was it was a lot of work for about two years to really get things settled down and and get the federation to where all the states were following the guidelines, yet they were autonomous. They I let the state directors do what they wanted to do. And so it was quite a full time job. And, you know, fortunately, uh, I, I was able to work from home here in Mount Juliet, Tennessee. I didn't have to go to the office. And that really helped a lot because I was able to just lock myself in the room and just do that work and be the ASA director and not have to get pulled, you know, one way or the other from little ancillary projects, which is take away your time and, and really destroy your focus on the, the you know, what's at hand. Right. So. But it, yeah, it, it time passed pretty quick, though. You know, I, I look back and I was like, man, that was, you know, 
that was 20 years. And it, I had fun. I mean, I had a lot of fun, did a lot of stuff. And the, uh, I think, you know, part of what I did was hopefully I had a little bit to do with, you know, getting ASA to where it is now. There sounds like you, you had a lot to do with a lot of them getting started. And... Yeah. And I think S3DA was the most fun getting, getting it started. And, uh, <laughs> I had kind of backed away from all the NASP stuff because I had a lot of other things going on. And this was about, I guess, 2000 and 2010, nine or 10. And I was doing a lot of coaching and I, I backed away from NASP and Mike Terrell called me. I think I was driving down to Louisiana to, to West Monroe for a pro-am. And he, he called me up and said, hey, have, have you got time to talk? I said, sure, Mike, I always got time to talk. And he goes, not to me. I said Jenny Richards. Well, yeah, I got time to talk to Jenny, but you know, I knew from experience that anytime Jenny called, if, if you were going to be on the phone, you needed a couple of hours because <laughs> she was going to talk your ear off about something. So he said, Well, she's got a really important project that she's working on that Fred Pape's behind, and I need you to talk to her and I need y'all to make this happen. Well, sure thing, whatever you need. And so Jenny Richardson called me up, and for about two hours on the road to West Monroe, we discussed the S3DA and what it was going to be and how it was going to be and what the rules were going to be and you know, how we were going to structure it. And and that was a very beneficial conversation. She and I worked together for about a year laying all the groundwork for S3DA before we rolled it out. And it's become a, a super organization now. And I'm just so happy to still be a part of it, you know, in some respect. I, I wrote all the curriculum uh, for the, the instructor and coach certifications and and you know, help with the rules. <clears throat> I'm still on the rules committee and, and then I'm on the board of directors and I'm just really proud of the, the work we did on that. And, and because it's partnered with all three of the, well, three of the four major U archery organizations, it's got, you know, ASA and uh, NFAA and USA Archery are the main tournament partner organizations. And so, I mean, I guess because IBO is partnered with NASP, but um, I think S3DA and NASP will start working a lot more closely together now. But yeah, it it, it was good. And I I think that, you know, I'm, I may be semi-retired, but I'm not ready to, to fade in the background yet. I still want to have something to do with, you know, archery and the organizations that, that make up our great sport here in the United States. Yeah, that's... It's nice being in there, and and that's what I like about doing these podcasts because I, you know, I get to talk to archers, you know, all over the world, all kind of different levels, and all interesting stories, and and you know, I learn a lot from from these, and you know, I'm just hope that you know people listening or watching learn a lot from them too, and you know, it's it's amazing to hear the stories how some of these organizations started out, and 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 your firsthand knowledge of how they started out because you were there, yeah. And and it it really was I, I I think my experience with with NASP was invaluable with starting S3DA when I helped with that because uh, Tim Strickland had been really put in charge by Roy Grimes to write a curriculum you know for the basic archery instructor and then the archery instructor trainer and then the archery instructor trainer specialist for uh, NASP. And I was lucky enough that I was able to help with some of that. Um, and Jenny and I would work on things and then Tim would come in and pretty much correct everything that we had worked on. <laughs> so, I mean, he's a great coach. I, I love Tim Strickland. I think the world of it. And, and so, you know, we wrote that curriculum at the same time, uh, the ATA was trying to standardize archery curriculum because you had USA Archery that was working with the uh, NADA, the National Alliance for Development of Archery. It was down in Florida. And uh, Doug Ng was in charge of that. And they had a, a curriculum. It was a pretty good. The level one was similar to the level one course that we're using now. The level two was a three-day monstrosity where you taught string making and a lot of stuff. I mean, it took three full days to teach that doggone thing. And then their level three coach course was about a six or seven day course at an Olympic training center. 
And so I took a level two course and then I went and got my level three coach certification. And the uh, ATA was trying to standardize all of the curriculums. And I think the NFAA and USA Archery were using the same curriculum with the 12 steps to the 10 ring or something and uh, a lot of different stuff because that was they had a different game. And then NASP really had to come up with its own curriculum because they were shooting at 10 and 15 meters in gymnasiums. And so there had to be some differences. And I think that what we ended up doing was we kind of modernized the instruction from USA Archery and NFAA that NADA was pushing. And so by modernizing that instruction, then we gave USA Archery, because they had absorbed NADA by that time, and we gave USA Archery a reason to modernize their instruction. So they spent a lot of money, worked with ATA, and came up with a really snazzy level one and level two book. And in the meantime, I was working on the level three coach course. Uh, and this was in about 2008. And I was working on a level three coach course because uh, there was nothing between the level two and the existing level three. There was a big gap. And the existing level three course was really for like international coaching, development of Olympic athletes. And it didn't really concern itself with, you know, the club level or a community level like a, a golf teaching pro. You know, you don't need to, you know, be a, a master's winner to be a teaching pro at a club. And so I went to work writing the level three, the original level three course, which was designed to teach people to coach archery, like at the high school level, the the club level in a, in a community. And when I met with Coach Lee at the time, uh, and I still have the sheet that I wrote on, I had it listed like level one level two and then way up here to level three and then way up here to level four. And I wrote to the side level one and level two. I put on their basic instructor, advanced instructor. And then in the middle, that gap, community coach and regional coach and elite coach. And that was in about 2000, in the summer of 2008. And that's where, that's where those names came from. And he said, I like it. You know, it looks good. And so we developed it and I think 2009 or 10, they, the USA Archery adopted that course and it's stayed relatively unchanged for about 13 years. There've been, this is the third iteration. They revised it once and then now it's a lot online and just a little bit in person. And, and it's the, the whole coaching profession, I think has changed from more from just shooting arrows and teaching people, Oh yeah, you got to be in alignment, stay in your back and make a smooth release. You know, now it's more centered on the, the mental game and then a lot of physical activities too to strengthen certain body parts. And and I believe that, that coaching, especially like the USA Archery Level 4 course, has really evolved. Now it's gotten into a lot of pedagogy and the actual means and methods of teaching and recognizing at what learning level uh, archers are. You know, are they associative or you know, whatever, do they, you know, how are they actually processing this stuff now that you're teaching them? And I think it's a lot better because now coaches instead of just walk up and go, okay, shoot three arrows. Let me tell you what you're doing wrong. They're involving the archers in that training. They're saying, shoot three arrows. Let me watch you. And now let me ask you some questions. And, and you, you tell me now what you feel, you tell me, you know, how it feels, you know, when you come at full draw, where are you feeling the tension in your back? You know, where, how are you moving your arms? You know, how, what, what's the balance on your feet? So, and you're making them more aware of, of what they're doing and how they're doing it instead of just putting in a thousand repetitions a day and say, okay, good. You scored one point higher progress. <laughs> That's not progress. <laughs> no, it's not. It, it's not. So, so I think there, there's a lot of good stuff going on in that realm, you know, and, and it's because there's been a need for the evolution that archery has evolved. I mean, you know, when Brady Ellison broke the national record after, I mean, Rick McKinney held the national record for like 24 or 28 years for, for a feet around. And it took Brady Ellison that long to break that record, or it took, took that long before he broke it. 
But once he broke it, everybody was shooting that score. It's like archery. It took that long for it to finally get up to Rick McKinney's best day. But then once it did, it's like everybody was there. Yeah. And now if you shoot that score now, you don't make the cut. Yeah. And that, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's interesting, you know, how, how things advance. And uh, I know um, I went to the NFA um, instruction in 95 and yeah. that's when I got my uh, instruction, you know, certification for uh, it, being an instructor. And, uh, you know, then about that time I was also doing martial arts at the same time. So I kind of took the, what I'm learning from martial arts and on the body mechanics and how the body works and then, you know, putting them into, uh, you know, the techniques that they were teaching, you know, back tension release and all that kind of stuff. And, right. and you, you know, my theory, when I'm teaching somebody, I'm going to tell you how I do it. And then we're going to adjust it to fit you because it's right. not going to work exactly for you. And, and I've always done that, you know, <laughs> teaching martial arts for many years and, and, you know, and, and archery and everything else. It's like, you'll learn real quick, you know, how to determine you know, something's not working. You have to go a different way. You know, that may not understanding the words you're saying in the order you're saying them, but now you have to step back. It's like, okay, how, what different way can I teach the same thing? Yeah. We did that a lot in martial arts. The techniques are the same. It's like, I can teach you one way or the other way, one way you get it, one way you don't. And then same thing yeah. with archery, you know, you, you got to just adapt to that shooter because, you know, your body's different than mine. And every archer's body is a little bit different and we have to adjust for it. Yeah. And that's one thing that, you know, I've always working with coach Lee, being able to work with him when I was on the junior dream team as a coach for that, like almost 10 years. Uh, and we would go to four camps and we'd, you know, do other stuff. And the, uh, but he always said that, you know, the whole NTS method is not, it's not something that's set in stone that should be cradled to the grave. It's something that's a basic form. And this is how we teach beginning archers. But once they start to master this, then we need to start tailoring the instruction and the techniques to that archer. And, you know, there, he, and I, I do too, I teach that there's four techniques to archery. There's the principle of alignment and the principle of holding and the principle of expansion with compound and recurve. It's the same thing. It's increasing back tension. And then the principle of follow through. And it doesn't matter what technique you use to get to alignment, as long as you get there. I, right. I don't care how you do it. You, you just got to get there. But, you know, so many coaches think, oh, there's only one way. And I'm going to teach you one way to do it. You know, or there's only one way to achieve holding. Or there's only one way to expand. There's only one follow through that I want to see. And I, I mean, I look at people that, you know, especially at ASA, and I went to the Pro amps for 25 years. And I watched Jeff Hopkins. Jeff Hopkins is one of the winningest pros ever to walk the face of the earth in ASA. I mean, even Levi Morgan, I mean, Levi probably still hasn't yet, has yet to win as much as Jeff did as a pro and a senior pro. And, but Jeff has the most funky kind of release holding method. I mean, he gets up here at anchor and his hands all twisted around. I can't even get my hand in that position but it, it wins for him, you know? And I mean, who's to say that there's only one way to hold a release? No, there's not. You get no. to a consistent anchor, you get to a consistent anchor, you develop your back tension, and then you maintain it through your release and follow through. You know, I mean, I, I know people, we used to shoot with a guy here locally, everybody called him shaky because he'd hold so long that he'd just be just shaking like a <laughs> thing, a tree in a hurricane, bam, X. <laughs> it's like, what? And to do it again five times in a row x x x and he shoot 360 x is shaking like a, like a damn bush in a hurricane it's like I don't, know, I don't know how you do it i can't so i'm with you you know you you find something that works and if it's not working then then you should as a coach you should know about a hundred different ways to make it work and usually right. one of those ways is about three steps before the point where it's not working anymore and because you just have to kind of unravel it until you get to that sequence. And so and that's what I love about coaching is just, you know, the whole experimentation process until you find out what's going to work for that archer. Yeah, the thing is be consistent. If you can do it consistently every time, you're going to get better. <laughs> that's that's the make, problem. That's why they make movable sites, Roy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
I, mean, how about, I hear people, then my arrows are all landing to the left. Well, then move your sight. <laughs> the, try, try moving your sight, see where they go. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, you know, it's like, well, the, the sights are, are set. You know, you, well, they can move. and yeah, They can uh, move. That's, I mean, I heard Linda Beck tell this kid we were at a tournament down in El Salvador. And he was, I mean, the boy was pretty good. And he was shooting his hitting left or right, whatever, blah, blah, blah. And he, he was shooting and shooting and shooting and shooting. And Linda kept telling him, hey, you know, you're hitting hot, you're hitting hot, you're hitting hot. And finally, he came off the line and she grabbed me and says, do you have any idea how much money your daddy paid for a movable site? Move the damn thing. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, yeah, man. I mean, yeah. Oh, he's shooting high, I mean, oh, he's shooting high. I mean, we can duct, duct tape a, a toothpick on there if you want to, but you know, you're going to pay $600 for a movable site and a scope, you know, use it. Yeah. So, but yeah, it's, and that's the great thing about archery is that, you know, you got all the different people and, and the different players. And I've, I've just been fortunate to have associated with some really good people. And I, I've learned a lot from them. You know, I, I think that, you know, even somebody who's not that good, maybe you can talk to them a little bit and figure out, you know, what they're doing that, makes them not good and then you can use that knowledge to you know help your students or yourself avoid those same mistakes you know and so you you learn something you know from everybody that you come in contact with and hopefully yeah they learn something from you you know and and then it's and that's that's the whole give and take of archery the sharing of knowledge and yeah and, and we get that a lot on here you know i share knowledge and you know, I'm talking to share knowledge, and you know, it's like we're all learning, and we're learning every day, and uh, it, it's that's the the fun part. There's so many things you can do, and um, you know, I'm I'm kind of one of the the old school ones where I I do have a newer bow, but I have a 2001 hunt with a 2003 that I have, and then I got a 2000 what 15 or 16 that I haven't even set up yet because I was working at Cabela's and. Uh, they got in some defective bows, especially something, yeah. something was broke on them. And our store would get a big pallet of them. We'd put them all together and make stuff. So I managed to get, you know, $900 bear uh, snow camel bow for like 150 bucks. But it, Whoa, needed a string. It, it needed a string. It needed, you know, the, the cable, the um, cable stop. Um, yeah. That then that was messed up. Uh, a few other things. And it was a return bow. And it's like, I make strings. It's like I can make a string every month and never run out of string material. I'm right. have to buy my loop material, but um, you know, so I fixed it all up and I still never set it up, but I still got my other bows that I shoot. So no, that's that's good though. Well, one of these days one of them old bows is gonna blow up on you and you'll need a new bow. <laughs> you got one sitting there. But you know, you, you talk about making strings, and, and it's really funny this the uh I had gotten a, a bunch of of string material from Bob from BCY. And it was stuff that's, you know, is off color or, or short rolls that were, you know, light and stuff like that. And so yeah. he, he made me a, a really good offer on those things. And basically he just gave me a sack of stuff and said, he asked me, he said, you charge your students for strings? I said, no, I teach them how to make their own strings. And <laughs> I'm not going to make strings for my students. And he said, well, in that case, here, take this. And he handed me a sack of stuff and had, some spools, of 8125 and 8190 and different size servant threads and some loop material. And so, you know, that's one of the first things is if I'm working with a recurve student, as soon as they get to where, you know, they're going to buy archery equipment is I teach them how to make a string. And it's I don't charge them for that, for that teaching. It's like, come on up here, pick a day, pick a Saturday or something that you don't have anything to do because it's going to take about four hours to teach you how to make this string. And then you're going to make your first string that you're going to shoot on that bow. And they do. And it's amazing. You know, when they stand out there in the yard and we sight the bow in, they back up to 50 or 60 meters and put one in the 10 ring on a string that they just made. And, you know, I, I kind of re, uh, compare it to when I first started learning how to reload ammo. Yeah. And, you know, the, I've been shooting, I mean, all my life. My dad had us shooting 22s when we were four years old. And uh, the, uh, I mean, I killed my first deer when I was six. And so, you know, I learned how to reload because me and my cousin, our allowance money wasn't covering all, 
all the shooting we did back then powder was cheap i i pulled yeah. a can of powder out that had a seven dollar price tag on a pound of something from you know rei sporting goods but you know that i remember that, that first bunch of bullets i loaded and you know printed a group about the size of a quarter at 100 yards i was like oh my god i was the happiest kid in town yeah and it's the same way you know with archers learning how to make their own arrows and make their own strings and you know learning how to to you know fit their own tabs and releases and all you know it it's amazing that it's just shooting a bow to me is it's just kind of like monkey work i mean the bows nowadays as long as you you've got the equipment and everybody makes good high-end bows and they've got great sights I and mean, there's not much difference between a shibuya and a true ball and a whatever. I mean, they're all the same. Yeah. And you put that stuff on there and you got the best equipment money can buy. If you can hold it still and make a good release, then you can group with that thing like never before. Yeah. And so to make archery exciting, I think it's, it's the educational process of the archers themselves is they, they need to learn to work on their own equipment. They need to learn how to make their own arrows and they need to learn that stuff early on in the game. Yeah. You know, because I learned to make arrows. A buddy of mine, Gary Hudgens, we were down at the archery shop one day and I had a half dozen arrows in my hand that had veins ripped off of them. And I asked the, the shop owner, I said, hey, Joe, you know, can you refresh these arrows? He's like, yep, it's going to be $3 a piece plus a dollar for cleaning, four dollars. And he said, Gary says, what are you doing, man? You know, you're talking like 25 bucks. And I said, well, I ain't got no way to do it. And he pointed down in the, in the showcase and he said, you see that right there? That's a bitch and burger fletching jig, best on the market. Get it. I was like, but that's 60 bucks. He said, well, if you do this three times, you bought a jig. I was like, oh, <laughs> so I bought that fletching jig and, and he came he came to the house with me and I bought a you know a pack of veins and a, a tube of fletch tight. And I learned how to fletch arrows that afternoon. And I've been fletching arrows. I don't know how many thousand dozen arrows I've fletched since then. You know, and so that's, I think it's important that, you know, when people in any sport, they need to learn, you know, the mechanics of the equipment and the mechanics of the shooting, and then learn how to, how to actually do stuff on their own instead of just, oh man, well, this broke, I'll take it down to the archery shop and get it fixed. No, I mean, figure out how to fix it yourself. You know, make your yeah. own strength, make your own strength. So what string material for the price is cheap. You know, you can make, you can make probably, 50 recurve strings out of an eighth ounce, eighth ounce or an eighth pound roll, two ounce roll. And so, yeah, it's, it's, it's just part of the game. It's part of the sport. Yeah. And you know, when, when I was getting mine, it, you know, if I buy a roll of string material, you know, I use 8125 for the compounds and mm -hmm. B 500 for the recurves. Um, BCY is pretty much all I, I bought, right. um, but I'd buy one roll. I'd make one string and the roll's paid for. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. And I have enough to make you know, it's like 50 strings or better out of out of one of those one pound rolls. <laughs> yeah, I took a roll is is lime green. I mean fluorescent lime green, 8125, <laughs> down to Columbia, down to Medellin, Colombia. And this is years ago. And it was just in case somebody blew a string up, you know, so we could make a new string. And had some some uh D3 or 3D server material on. Yeah. yeah. Somebody needed a string. And I was like, okay, good. So I pulled pull it out of my bag and threw it to him and said, here you go. And then one of the Colombian kids came up and he said, hey, coach, you know, can I, can we, can I borrow your string material? We need, I need to make a string. I said, sure, you know, go ahead. And I said, just use, use whatever you need, man. Bring it back. He said, oh, okay, great. Well, I, I guess he didn't quite understand that I meant for him to use whatever he needed because I learned, turned around about two hours later there's like a dozen lime green strings going across that field. <laughs> Brought me the roll back, and it looked like it hadn't even been used. I mean, it's, you know, because it's like, it's like, dude, give me that string. It's, <laughs> I didn't mean for you to make the whole team strings, but they did. They, <laughs> that was like, that was like the color of the day, man. Had, I, I swear they had a dozen lime green strings that they made. Everybody needed a new string. Yeah. So, Yeah, that's yeah. kind of fun. It's just making all kinds of different ones. And I know I was, I was doing some things on making strings and um, I made up some little sample ones to kind of show, well, okay, uh, here's 
yeah, lime green and pink. <laughs> yeah. You know, and then I need another one, uh, purple and pink. Um, <laughs> and here's another one. Uh, I think it's copper and blue. Um, black and copper, I think this one is. Um, and then I just made one. Um, I, I've made some what I call uh, braiding instead of just regular twisting. Right. What I do is, is um, ends up doing is a twist on each each side, so you put right. side of each other, and then they form little V's in your string. And huh. when I had my store, I just made a video. I just uploaded it to the my YouTube channel as well as our Chuck One One Face uh, Facebook group. And I got a friend of mine that want to have my store. I'm I don't remember doing it, but I must have made his wife one of those strings because he started making strings. He's down south someplace. I forget where he's at now. Um, but so he's make, started making strings and his daughter says, I'm one one like mom's got. He didn't know how to make one. <laughs> oh my gosh. I don't know if anybody that's made strings that way. And he had to, so, he had to figure it out, huh? Yeah. So it's like, well, I'll make a video and I'll post it, you know, how to do it. And, <laughs> you know, I kind of did, I made a 50 inch string and then I made it exactly 50 inches. And then I, you know, twisted them inside and out, you know, kind of right. what I call the braiding and then measured it, didn't change. And then I put like 12 twists in it in it and it shortened it um you know half inch right you know a quarter inch first one is i tie my ends together so mm -hmm. i have a continuous loop and then on the jig i'll turn the ends of it and i'll get it real i'll stretch it before i even do any serving on it right and i I'll do I, I serve it under pressure yeah i serve yeah. mine under pressure and so i started at 50 inches and then after i tied all the knots got it stretched i was 50 and a quarter and then you know, I, I did 50 wraps inside out. And then right. I did, uh, uh, no, I did 20, yeah, 25, I don't know, 50 wraps inside. And then I did um, 25 twists. And now it was a, a quarter inch short, shorter than <laughs> 50 inches. So then I took, you know, 13 of them outside 12 and then right. it went back the same length. So, you know, I kind of wanted to show you know, how much stretch you're going to get. And I know some of them don't tie them and then they stretch them after they've made them. Well, then yeah. they got to stretch them out after that. I stretch them before. So now I know I can put the twist back in it to get it back to the length I want. Um, you know, I, I, I figured that by twisting them inside out, you know, kind of braiding them, they they would uh, um, shorten up a little bit more than it did, but it didn't really shorten up much. It's when I started twisting them that I really got right. them to shorten. Yeah, yeah, the twisting them is what shortens them up. I and I do that with mine. I I take them and make sure I serve off thin loops and all that, and then and then do the twisting and and put them under pressure to serve them because it locks that serving in. Oh yeah. And, and I, I don't, you know, none of none of my archers they all make them because I teach them that way. And and you don't ever have that situation to where they're you know on end number seven of a long day, and then oh my god, coach, my my end serving's coming loose, and my or my my center serving's coming loose. You know don't run into that it stays pretty good but yeah i i tell you i i love this sport and it's just so multifaceted now too with all the international competitions and you know that i remember used to go into a you know an indoor world cup was like a big deal and now people are just like oh yeah i think i'll just go to madagascar or uh, i'll go to Nîmes, or i'll you know let's just go to wherever let's just go down here to to singapore and, and they just they go all over. I got two students now that they were in in Berlin, you know, for a tournament, and then went to Kings of Archery in Denmark. And twenty years ago, that would have been unheard of unless you were a a traveling pro. Yeah. But now, now if you've got a bow and you can find all your arrows after every end, then you know <laughs> you can go where you want to go. There's so many open events, you know, open world ranking events, and I think that that's that is a good thing for archery, and. You know, I tell parents, you know, it's like, hey, you want to take a, a vacation to Medellin, Colombia? Oh, yeah. Well, good. Then, you know, get your kid ready to shoot that, uh, you know, Pan Am Championships, which is an open event for cadets. Or now it's U18, U21, adults and masters. And you can take a eight day vacation while they're sweating on the archery range. <laughs> <laughs> Put them on the bus in the morning and meet them at the bus in the afternoon. And, you know, I'll watch them for the rest of the day. There you yeah. go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, I hang around with them, leave them with the coach. He can do the babysitting, right? <laughs> That's right. Once, once they're, once they're on that bus, they're taken care of. 
<laughs> yeah, <laughs> get them on the bus, and you got somebody watching them. Yeah, but that that's getting. I've, I've seen more and more is that you know the people are bringing their their wives and and significant others on you know international archery trips, and you know while we're all on the field, you know the 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 plus ones all get together and go on tours and whatever, and so and it's it's a big thing, and I think it's a it's a good thing. I mean. You know, so maybe it costs you a couple thousand dollars a piece to go spend, you know, eight days in Iguazu Falls, Argentina. But it's going to cost you at least that much if, or more if you go on vacation. You're right. You know, so, and I know we, we just went to, they just had a Pan Am Field Championships for the first time in 42 years in Iguazu Falls, uh, Argentina. And it was great. It was a, an awesome tournament. It was hot. And it rained a lot, and but we had a good time, and and the, and those are just you know times that as an archer you look back on them. If you've never been on a, a real international event, it's something that you really should do, you know. And you you can register for the register for the things through USA Archery, and um, or now even World Archery they have what they call Open Waros, the World Archery Registration Enrollment System, and. Uh, you can register straight through World Archery and then you just buy your own plane ticket. You pick the hotel you want to stay in, throw them your credit card number, and that's it. You're on your way. So it's gotten easier now where it used to, you know, 15 years ago, oh man, it was a big production to go to an event outside the United States. But now it's it's just simple. It's really a matter of just going online, registering for the event, buy you a plane ticket, and once you get there, your feet never touch the ground. They pick you up at the airport. They put you on a bus. They take you to the hotel. Then they take you from the hotel to the tournament and from the tournament back to the hotel. You know, maybe the only thing you have to buy is sometimes dinner's not included or maybe there's lunch on the field. And you, uh, you know, you, you just really, you live a pretty good life for about eight days. And you get to shoot a lot of archery and eat some stuff from a menu that you can't translate <laughs> open your open your order in something safe <laughs> that's what they make google translate for so you can hold it up over the menu and it'll it'll translate it for you yeah <laughs> yeah i use that every once in a while when i get someone makes a comment and it's like i don't know what they're saying i put it in and say okay uh figure out what it says and then translate to english and i've had some it's like this still don't make sense <laughs> i don't know what you're saying <laughs> And I'm just saying, oh, thanks for the comment, you know. <laughs> hey, Google Translate's gotten me out of some jams, and I've, I've, I've used it for Russian and Polish and Czechoslovakian and Spanish, and I don't know what else. <laughs> but yeah, that's that's a that's a great deal, man. Yeah. Well, hey, I, I got about five minutes, and I have to go to my future daughter-in-law as a concert, so I'm going to have to. Oh, have don't to miss that. Up. No, I don't want to miss that. I want this girl to be my be my daughter in law. So, <laughs> but um, yeah. So, what else do we need to talk about, real quick? Well, um, I would just say, you know, what what would you say to somebody that's just starting out in archery? What what would you say to them? I would say that the first thing that I think they should do is to buy the best equipment. That they can afford and i believe you buy once you cry once right you know and, and that's it and you get the best that you can afford both bows arrows whatever it doesn't matter and then take advantage of every opportunity that comes by to learn something question people talk to them you know ask them people are archers are the the most i get think giving people in the world when it comes to advice you know, I've never met somebody that, you know, walk up and go, why do you do, why do you do that? Why do you shoot like this? Why do you hold your release like this? And they'll tell you, they'll tell you yeah. everything. I mean, and you got pros, they'll do it too. I mean, Braden Galantine and Jesse Broadwater and all those guys, Steve Anderson, man, he go up there and tell, even like Chance Bopath. I've known Chance since he was like 13 years old. And, and you ask them something and they will tell you exactly why and even show you how to do it, you know? And so never you know, pass up an opportunity to learn from the best and never pass up an opportunity to learn what not to do from, from the worst. Yeah. And, 
then just get out there and shoot. Just grab your bow, you know, find yourself a coach if you want to. I mean, it's, it's not inexpensive, but I think a good coach is a valuable thing to have because you can call them up any time of day or night and say, oh, man, I'm having a problem. Like, okay, send me a video. I'll tell you. Yeah. And so so that's, that's it, really. Buy, buy good equipment and learn from everybody and everything. Shoot your bow and find yourself a coach. And if you do that, I think you're going to have a really good time in archery. And it's a never-ending sport. There's so many different things that you can do. 3D, field, target, indoor, outdoor. I mean, it's just, it's all there. You can shoot yourself into a coma every day of the week <laughs> and and still not still not do it all. Yeah. Yeah, that's 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 some good advice. You know, you just gotta get out there and get the equipment that you want. And and you know, there are things that I I you know I recommend, you know, if you have a choice, buy the, buy a really good release and mm -hmm. spend less money on the bow because the release is gonna help you shoot better. Yep. And you know, I always like to tell people it's like uh, oh, you're an archery? I use a really uh, wrist strap? Yeah. Well, I'll give you first lesson free. Quit pulling the trigger. It's like, <laughs> oh, how do you know I'm doing that? That's right. Pull yeah. through the trigger. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen people take the trigger way above their eye. Oh, dude. Their eye, and they just wind it up. The trigger. <laughs> I'm watching them wind it up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like you see that. It's like, oh, no. <laughs> Don't do that. Oh, my God. Uh, uh, let, let me help you. <laughs> But that's why I put my uh, instructor patch on my quiver. I figure somebody yeah. has a question. It's got the patch on. It says, I'm an instructor. Come up and ask me. You know, I don't go up to them and say, hey, I can make you shoot better. You know, no, they're not, not. You know, if you want to, you want help, ask me. Like you said, you know, somebody's shooting. They're just going to help you out. And I was talking to one of the guys. He was shooting against one of the a top shooter. And he was yeah. struggling. And he's competing against him. He comes over and helps him. Yeah. It's like he's helping you beat him. <laughs> yep. And, and that's just just what we get. And, and that's the kind of people that the archers are. They really are. So yeah. but then well, hey, I, I tell you what, I really appreciate this. And if you decide you you want to do it again sometime in the future, man, let me know. Um I can talk archery for days. <laughs> yeah. Well, any anytime you want back on, we'll, we'll come back on. And I'm I'm not opposed to having you back on. Well. We'll pick a different subject to talk about and yeah, hey, maybe we talk about you can talk about. Maybe we talk about reloading ammo and deer hunting or something. Yeah. <laughs> I I've been reloading I got my first reloading press in 1976. Yep. RCBS Rock Chucker. And I've loaded thousands <laughs> of rounds. <laughs> oh man. Well, I, I tell you, I'm right there with you. I've got a an RCBS uh progressive, uh four station progressive. I don't use the progressive mode, I do everything by hand, but but I've got, and I think I got it back about the same time, about in the mid to late seventies. Yeah. And that, that hunk of cast iron has saved me a million dollars on ammo. But, oh yeah. Well, a nice thing about reloading, same thing with doing your own equipment in archery is yep. I was able to work up a load from my OT6 and my 270 to put three shots in the same hole. Right. Factory ammo, you can't do that. No, but you can. I mean, you can go up a half grain, tenth of a grain, I mean, I, I and I use an old RCBS five hundred five beam beam scale, it's and like I, actually, I have. I, yeah, and I use I actually take it, throw it short, trickle it in, and then the last couple of, of kernels, and I pick it up with tweezers. And but yeah, well, hey, I got to run, Roy. I appreciate this, man. It's been good. It's been yeah, fun talking to you. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun having you on, and and we'll have to do it again. And uh, for those that have made it this far, uh, we'll put a description in there on how to get a hold of. Uh, um the different things we talked about and uh, uh we'll we'll see you on the next one and this has been a lot of fun my name is Roy Canterbury I've been your host on Arch Talk 101 and we'll see you on the next one <laughs>